Someone said once about me, he's not the brightest candle in the room, but he burns longer than anyone else. And that's exactly what I do. I won't be defeated, you see. This week on High Performance, we welcome boxing legend Barry Hearn. I can't tell you how many times I've had the most amazing bits of luck. Don't you think, though, that the successful people are open to the luck? They're expecting the lucky break. Everybody gets that bit of luck. Some people don't recognise it and others don't take advantage of it. See, I never took a risk in my life. You know, my dad was a bus driver and my mum was a child lady. The worst thing I could have been was a conductor. In life, if you don't feel good about yourself, how do you expect other people to feel good about you? Yeah. I get up in the morning, I'm excited. Every day. Now, it's embarrassing. I'm 74. I should be calming down. I'm getting worse. Bazza, you've bang had it off, son. Let's go and have another day. To change a whole sport with its social hang-ups, and then you say, yeah, and 22,000 people bought a ticket at the Schalke football stadium to watch it. Eat that. What was the moment realising that you were poor? I never knew I was poor until I was 10 or 11. I didn't know people, they didn't know toilets. I wasn't unhappy, I was happy every day. I had a loving family around me. Pressure is only felt by those that fail. What that really means is that people make excuses for their own weaknesses. We've all got an opportunity in life to do something and it won't always go right. And if you do fail, use that as a springboard to succeed. You will run a better business and a better life if you think poor. It makes you get value for money. You're gonna think poor and say, I want my value. It doesn't make you a nasty person. It just means don't disrespect me. People say, what's enough money? And there is no enough. You're playing a game. You're playing to win. There's no limit. You don't stop. You don't ever stop. Because once you stop, what else is there to do? So you don't think you've made it? Oh, of course not. I'm nowhere near come to the end of it. People with small visions think we've made it. That's because they haven't got the vision. You've got to look at that little light coming down the tunnel and convince yourself it's not a train coming towards you. Well, it's a long way away. So you never, ever stop. Because if the day you stop, you're weak. And the day you're weak, you won't be a success. The answer is to have an open-ended approach. To say, I just want to be the best I can be every day of my life every hour of my life. There isn't a day off, there isn't a time off mentally, but it taught me lots of things. And you learn more about yourself in adversity than you'll ever learn in success. And what did you learn about yourself that surprised you? I've got some nuts, mate. I'm unbeatable. I'm totally and completely, unequivocally un. Beatable. Listen, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our new subscribers, but you know, most people that watch this content on YouTube don't subscribe. I want to change that. The more subscribers, then the more amazing we can make high performance. And I've had a lovely message actually from Rob who says, I only recently discovered the High Performance channel and I watched the full Eddie Howe and Tyson Fury interviews, both some of the best content I've seen in the last five years on YouTube. Listen, if you agree and you want to keep this amazing stuff coming for free, then hit subscribe right now. Thank you so much. Well, look, thank you very much for making the time, by the way, to well, do this. God, what are you joking? Well, you two. It's a so much it's high performance. Yeah, exactly. You can only dream of being invited. This is like the Royal Variety Performance of Podcast. <laughs> and that's we'll the last time it. I'm going to be nice to you. <laughs> well, look, let's start then with the name of the podcast. We always start with this same question. In your mind, what represents high performance? Well, you can't take the chartered accountant out of the chartered accountant. High performance is represented by bottom line success. Uh, it's what you do with the bottom line success which defines your own success. And whether you're creating a, a sustainable business for whatever reason, um, the performance is just to be the best you can be. And that's what you try to do every day. In the knowledge that you will fail many times, that you will make dozens of mistakes, but you will make thousands of decisions. Very nice. Well, your decisions are defined by your 10 rules for life. And what we mm. wanted to do with this conversation was to base it on the 10 rules. Mm. And we'd love you to sort of put some meat on the bones for us. So your first rule for life is it's better to be born lucky than good looking. Well, it's so true. You know what I mean? Because without that little bit of luck, and no matter what you might think how bright you are or how well qualified you are, we all need that bit of luck. We need, we need the now to take advantage of that. Bit what of was luck. yours? I've had a lifetime of God smiling on me. I can't tell you how many times I've had the most amazing bits of luck. I mean, whether it's a ginger kid just knocking on the door random saying, can I play in one of your snooker tournaments, Mr. Hearn? And it turns out to be Steve Davis. Whether it's B Sky B coming over the hill when I was probably about to go skint, having lost millions of pounds, they were like the cavalry coming over. Is that in the right? Sports it world. was that close for you, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Historically, I made a lot of money in 1982. 
probably before you both were born. Yeah. Um, and I was going to retire. I was 34. I've been quite smart. Uh, I had a passion for sport. I was always good at everything and never great at anything. But it gave me a little bit of a head start in the knowledge and appreciation of what sportsmen and women do. So I got stuck into it. And then I saw the vision of loveliness in America where I saw ESPN going from a porter cabin doing college basketball to being this amazing techno giant in television. And I thought one day, one day, something like that's going to come into England. So I started doing events in the 80s. And as usual, I was several years ahead of my time. So all I did was lost money, lost money, lost money until it all came right. And then a strange boxer with a lisp came into my life just on an off chance as a recommendation from Len Ganley, the snooker referee. And things like that have happened all the time. But uh, don't you think, though, that the difference between successful people and others is that the successful people are open to the luck because they're, yeah, well, we're they're expecting they're expecting the lucky break yeah. to come their way. And I think, that, you know, it's how you take advantage of that break. And entrepreneurs, which is a word used often, and there's not that many of them in truth, um, but we're risk takers. You know, we are... I, I always think it's fascinating, or I, well, it's fascinating to me, whether it appeals to anyone else. See, I never took a risk in my life because I had nothing to lose. You know, my dad was a bus driver, my mum was a char lady. The worst thing I could have been was a conductor or, you know, I don't know, a window cleaner. And even that's not bad. I always think I've put my own kids under much too much pressure in a way. Eddie especially. I mean, my daughter is technical genius, but she's not like me and Eddie. She's not a salesperson full of nonsense. Um, but Eddie's been under pressure from day one to follow in the footsteps and to go further, which he's magnificently managed to do, much to my chagrin. Um, but for me, I was never under any pressure. So there was nothing to lose. So I don't like the word pressure anyway, because it's, you know, it's another rule we come on to. So I think with me, being good looking is always nice, but you can't take away that bit of luck. And if you look at any successful person, there's a few key moments in their life where the good Lord smiled and Lady Luck dealt the cards and they were good enough to take advantage. And that's probably the key difference between everybody gets that bit of luck. Some people don't recognise it and others don't take advantage of it. So how important then, Barry, do you think humility is? Because your answer there just just reeks of humility that you've recognised. I don't take myself too seriously. Because I think, one, if you ever go on an aeroplane, look out the window, you realise that significant you're not. <laughs> you know, we're just a little bleep. On we all make ourselves out to be. And people who believe in themselves, I mean, you've got to believe in yourself. You've got to have self-belief. Of course you have, you know, because otherwise we wouldn't get up in the morning and do what we do. But at the same time, I think you've got to keep this sense of humour. You've got to realise you're not really that important in the bigger picture. So we're all going through, I mean, it sounds a bit deep, this is not like me at all, but we're going through this journey and if we can have a few smiles along the way and not take ourselves too seriously, you build a little wall around yourself like that. You compartmentalise things in your brain. You don't get hurt by other people so much or by circumstance or facts. Go on, tell us more about that. Well, because you don't allow it. You don't look back with any regret. It's a total waste of time. You can't do anything about it. You've already learned the lesson of that regret anyway because it happened. But there's no point looking back. And I'm tired of people saying, oh, I should have done this. I wish I'd have done that. Save your breath. You didn't. Move on. Look forward. Plan the future. Learn, of course, from mistakes. But don't let them change your life. So it's... I, Humility is a nice word to use. It's probably not quite, it's a bit more superficial than humility. It is what it is. It's superficial. So when you get bad things, you compartmentalize it. You lock it away somewhere in your brain. And if you're going to think about opening that box, you do it on your own and not in the public glare. So you never appear to be having a bad day because that really pisses off the opposition. Right, that takes us nicely, actually, onto your second rule. Tell the truth. Yeah. It's easier than telling lies. It is the most refreshing thing to be able to do. 
It's probably a reason why you call yourself independent thinking is, and I, and I don't think I've always told the truth, by the way. I mean, I think it's a luxury that comes later in life with perhaps commercial success or a feeling of uh, it's all going to end one day anyway, so what's the point, you know? But early doors, when you're out there grafting and trying to get somewhere, you do tell a few white lies. I'm, I don't know when I got to that stage of cutting off, but I think quite late in life. You know, I don't think I was always like that. You know, I was a chance of early doors. Of course, I was where I came from. I didn't have much excuse not to be. But when you do acquire that discipline of mind where you can actually tell people exactly what you're thinking, and those that appreciate it will love you for it, and those that don't, you don't really want to be in their company anyway. So give us an example of somebody that did appreciate your truth talking. Years ago, years ago, I got approached by some... Uh, dot com people from the States that wanted to buy my company. I was doing okay, not special. And they offered me a load of money. I think they offered me about 30 million quid. Oh, it was a lot of money. In those days, it was a fortune. Still a lot of money today. And I got involved. You know, I thought, this is it, you know. Business was quite tough. Let's get the money and get out of it. And I always remember walking around the garden with my wife, who was looking for a new house at the time. And she had a budget. My wife is old school. Proper, proper lady. Difficult. Impossibly difficult. 52 years married to the same woman. Horrendous. <laughs> how, she, how she's put up with me, I will never, ever know. But I would be lost without her. And I decided to do what I don't normally do, which is take people into my confidence. I'm quite an insular person other than direct family because... I don't think people deserve to be told my innermost thoughts. Yeah. That's why they're called innermost thoughts. You don't share them. But I shared them with her that we had this opportunity and if she was looking for a new house, she might, Did you, do you want a bigger budget because there's a few quid to spare? And I told her the story and she said, well, why are you doing this deal? And Well, you know, it's a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. She said, that. and what about you? I said, well, you know, I'm going to have to stay on for a few years to help the process. And she said, how did you feel about that? And I said, well, I don't really like these. They're loud. They're aggressive Americans. They bang the chair and the, do the desk. And she said, and is that where you've got to in life? That, you know, you what would surrender your is. independence. Is that where you've got to in life? Yeah. yeah. And I thought, no, I think I've gone a bit beyond that. And the following day, I phoned them up and said, the deal's off. And they'd done all their due diligence and whatever. They went potty. Tony young boys. And uh, I said, why? And I told them the truth. I said, I don't like either of you. And I don't really want to work with people like you. In fact, I don't even want people like you in my world. And they went, oh, the jaw dropped and they left. And I felt cleansed. I felt like I'd been baptised again. You know, waters had rushed over me and... And there was a stride come out and the chest came out. And I thought, you know, isn't it lovely? And it works in a much simpler scale, even with wives, families, whatever. Tell them, you know, tell them the truth. In business, it's quite unusual, really, especially in the cutthroat business that we're in. Yep. You know, you'd be a boxing promoter and tell people the truth. You know, as far as most people are concerned, boxing promoters are all gangsters, which they're not, of course. But it's an imagery. So it's refreshing and it makes you feel good about yourself, which I think in life, if you don't feel good about yourself, how do you expect other people to feel good about you? Yeah. So there's no pressure on that. See, I love that, Barry. Like, having been around sport a lot, I often divide people into two camps. You talk about people that tell you the truth and people that tell you the time. So the ones that deliver the stuff that mm. maybe you don't want to hear mm. are the truth tellers. The time tellers are the ones that tell you the fluff, tell you all the things that are easy to tell, like the time. Mm. So how do you make that distinction of allowing people into your world, into your business, and encourage them to be yeah. truth tellers rather than time tellers? It takes time. It takes time. I mean, we have a history. I mean, bear in mind that Matrim has grown into a, a sizable company now, but for years, I mean, it's a long time coming. You know, started in 1982 as a £100 company with me and a girl underneath a billiard hall in Romford. No, asp no aspirations whatsoever. I've just thought I've made some money. 
I had Steve Davis, who was world snooker champion. Let's have some fun. So I needed a vehicle. So we had a hundred pound company, called it Matrum, named after the room that Steve Davis used to play money games in over the years against top pros. It was, but it wasn't supposed to go anywhere. It wasn't written it was going to be a big company. It was just going to occupy my time as having fun. And, you know, having fun is an aspect where, again, it's this independence of thought that if you're not having fun, what, what are we doing it for? Now, it starts off, you have no choice. You've got to put bread on the table for the family. So that's not about having fun. That's about achieving a certain goal. But then you've got levels and you go up and down levels, don't you? And when you get to a certain stage, you can really have fun. And I think since 82, although we've had some tough times, we've had some disappointments and some tragedies along the way, we've had fun. And part of that fun is the type of people that we are, that we can tell the truth and we can... You pick your friends. I think you have to be a little bit cynical in this life because, let's be honest, they're not not all nice people, are they? True. Yeah. I deal in an industry where there's a lot of people that, you probably wouldn't have in your house as a guest, (laughs) but you get used to it and you treat them with honesty and respect and they return that, funnily enough, in a a different type of way. I mean, you know, there was years when we was running my old partner, Freddie King, who your dad knew well, both two great trainers. And uh, Freddie and I ran the fruit machines and the jukeboxes and the, pool tables for the whole of the East End. We ran the whole of the East End in that department and there was a lot of strange people there. (laughs) But we never had a problem with anybody because we just told them the truth and there was mutual respect. And that's a, it's a nice feeling to have that when you can walk into a room and everyone, they don't take liberties with you because they know you're not going to take liberties with them. That makes sense. So lesson number three, you've just said matchroom was about having fun. Mm. But number three on your list of your 10 rules for life is sheer work ethic. Yeah. Can well, make you look like work. a genius. Yeah, but isn't, isn't that working hard fun? No, I think it's work. I get up in the morning, I'm excited every day. Now, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I'm 74. I should be calming down. I'm getting worse. What are you excited about? I'm excited about deals. I'm excited about doing things. I'm excited about growing sports. I'm excited about changing lives. I'm excited about... Ratings. I'm excited about tickets. I'm excited. I'm I'm pathetic. I am a, an anorak. My heartbeat goes up as I drive to the office. I'm supposed to be retired. I go in nearly every day. My wife's killing me. When are you When are you going to spend more time in your house? I'm like, yeah, you know, yeah. Next week, week after, you know, I'll be I'll be back on to you on that. Uh, What's the secret then for people listening to this for finding a life that makes them feel like your life makes you feel? Probably have a very small brain like mine. I mean, I'm no, I'm no genius. I didn't go to university. I'm not, you know, I'm not a smart bloke. You know, do a crossword with me takes a long time, but I'm very good at, at numbers. A Sudoku, I'm great, you know. Crosswords, I'm terrible. Probably just, just feeling good about yourself. Having conversations with yourself in the mirror in the morning is always a good start to the day. What do you say? Bazza, you've bang had it off, son. Let's go and have another day. And every day you think, you know, we all, we're, we're, we're all not locked, you know, who knows, who knows. I hope to be playing cricket when I'm in my 90s. It's unlikely, but I'll give it my best shot. So the work ethic is absolutely fundamental to it, of giving everything your best shot. So I knew early doors I was no genius, but I don't. Someone said once about me, he's not the brightest candle in the room, but he burns longer than anyone else. And that's exactly what I do. I won't be defeated, you see. I don't don't think my ego will take it. I have to win. Everything is a competition, everything. So you go to my office and take my right-hand drawer. You will see a list of the number of days I've been in the gym for the last 12 years. And every month I look at it and go, you lazy bastard. You're letting it slip, Baz. You're letting it slip. You're doing less than you did last year and so on. So you make everything into a game and that's when you know you've cracked it because, like I love sport, but unfortunately God decided I was never going to be great at anything. But it didn't stop me loving sport. So I thought, well, 
I'll make business into a sport. So my business is a succession of sporting events and I want to win all of them. So I prepare diligently. I put in the dedication. I sacrifice. I put in the time. I create an environment where I'm the best I can possibly be. And then I bring up, put on my chartered accountant's hat and say, now really, how are we doing? Because people tell lies, but numbers never lie. So every year, I set out to beat what I did last year. And I will continue to do that until I'm pushing up the daisies. But the people that I've trained, and I've got a lot of tremendous people that come in, you know, very young, you know, Frank Smith on the boxing, joined us when he was 16, you know, as a, as a run around for poker tournaments, delivering pizzas and coffee. Matt Porter, who runs the darts, came in from the local newspaper when he'd just come out of university. And there's a whole succession of people like that. Uh, and they're trained with my ethos. You know, this is how we're going to run this business. Uh, it's changing. I can feel it changing because we're getting so big that we have to be what you might call a normal business, which I hate, which is why I came off the board because I'm never going to be chairman of a PLC. Wrong so, person, wrong job. So can I ask you then, Barry, like who trained you in that work ethic? My mum, I think. You described your mum yeah, being a child yeah. lady, your dad yeah, being a yeah. boss. Well, my dad was all, my dad had his first heart attack when he was about 29. Right. So, and his father had died early and his father, they were all in their forties. So when those days when you had a heart attack, they said, sit in a chair for three months and carry on smoking. You know, today is slightly different. Um, so my mother was the one who was, she was a working class snob, really. She's a lovely lady, but she was, you know, a tough old girl as always. The women in our world, my world, run everything. Right. You know, you know equality is something that never really came up in our household because the women were always the boss anyway. You know, the dad would come home on Friday, his wage packet would go on the table, it would be unopened because there was nothing left. He would have rattling money. In other words, any coin in the wage packet could go in his pocket. And the wife, my father never had a bank account in his life, never had money. When he died, he had one and tenpence on him in his pocket. That was his total assets. But the mother looked after everything and my grandmother was the same. I mean, I think it's a working class trait in all families. Yeah. Because um, there wasn't enough to go round, so no one was going to be silly with money. All It was all allocated. But she was the one that wanted me to be special, I think. And in her world, special was first off, you've got to learn to speak properly. So she sent me to elocution lessons when I was 11. As you can see, it had very little effect. <laughs> but after that, she sent me to, I think, Amateur Dramatic Society. I joined at 12. At 13, I was doing Bertok Breck plays and Shakespeare. And at 14, I was in the Verse Appreciation Society. I specialised in poems of Robert Graves and toured around all the schools. Right. Poetry. And that, it also taught me to look after myself because the kids took the mick mercilessly, yeah. as you can imagine. But it was my mother, as this is part and parcel of making. I hated it. Hated it. But looking back, it made me what I am. You know, go and learn your lines. Go upstairs. When I, when I, she, got me a job effectively as an article clerk and as a chartered accountancy. She was the one every night. Go to, as soon as you finish your meal, I'm 18 years old. No, there's no going out. You know, go to your room, lock the door, three hours before you go to bed. Wow. Le read that. There was never a possibility of failing an exam because I knew it all. I didn't, may not have known what it meant, but I knew it word perfect. And it was just about the work ethic. She said, you know, if you're not the brightest thing in, Read that book five times instead of once, you know. Brilliant. Just put the hours in. Put the hours in and you'll be all right. And it worked. And it's worked ever since, even today. I have a prodigious work ethic now, which is sometimes annoying to those around me. Yep. And especially when I'm supposed to be retired and putting my nose in, all these bright young people doing this business and making broadcast and sport so attractive to everybody. But there's an underlying role for us as well which is taking away barriers to entry, diversity. All these things are commonplace in the background where I came from and they're really important to me. Mm. So, you know, I want to see people like me be successful, but they've got to make the effort that I made 
Or if not, I will throw them away like a used tissue. And I don't think you're joking there, are you? I think no. people have to come up to your standard. Absolutely. Standing. No, no, no. I don't joke about things like that. Mm. You can be nice to everybody, but if they won't help themselves, I don't have time to change the world. I can change if I've got the right army with me, which I have. And individual sports like darts, snooker, boxing, but particularly darts probably. I think when I finish, I'll look back on darts and say that was the biggest because to change a whole sport with its social hang-ups and, oh, fat blokes throwing arrows. Yeah. And then you say, yeah, and 22,000 people bought a ticket at the Schalke Football Stadium to watch it. Eat that, you know. It's, it's like us getting even against the rest of the world. I think we all have a little chip on our shoulder as well. I had a big chip on my shoulder. Anyone who spoke Because nicely. of what? Well, because of what you haven't got and what other people have got. You want it. You, you know, I never knew I was poor until I was 10 or 11. I didn't know people, they right. didn't know toilets, you know, and things like that. But you just, kids, and I wasn't unhappy. I was happy every day. I had a loving family around me. And Later on, you realise you want, you want those things. You go up, you see the houses on the top of the hill and you say, why haven't I, how can I get one of these? You know, well, there's two or three paths you can go down. Right. You know, and that's where your parents come in and steer you in the right direction. And what was, so... What was the moment that you remember realising that you were poor? I started a car washing round when I was 12 with a mate of mine at school. And we borrowed enough money to get a bucket and a sponge and all that. And I see all these big houses half a mile away at the top of the, you know, we was on the council estate at the bottom. And I just see these houses and these cars, you know, knocking on the door, it's going to wash your car, five shillings a car, you know. And you'd work, and then later on it became gardening, window cleaning, babysitting, anything to make a few quid. Because when you saw things, it was, it, it was quite clear. You could either steal it and get it for free and get yourself in trouble, or you could work hard. Well, washing cars is, you know, how many, all I used to think, but how many can I do in a day? Yep. And what time's it going to get dark, you know? So the drive was there because I wanted, I wasn't going to steal anything. I knew that was wrong. So I was just going to work hard and, and get it. So, you know, I remember buying my first scooter at school. 240 quid it was. Lambretta GT200. Absolute nuts. Absolute nuts. And no one in my school had a brand new Lambretta GT200. And I paid cash. And every penny came out of that bucket. And I... I met a lady that I used to wash her car. Well, I'm going off tangent here, but bear with me. Uh, I, I became part of her family. I was known as Boy Barry because I saw the kids grow up, you know, and I got almost adopted by them. And I went to see her about a year ago, and she's very old now, very, you know, quite frail. And she sort of looked at me and she said, you always said you'd have a golden bucket one day. Really? Yeah. And I remember saying that, one day. It's like Fools and Horses, Rodney, one day we're going to be, one day I'm going to have a golden bucket. And I've got that golden bucket now. In fact, I've got several of them. Brilliant. And I've earned every single one of them. Let's talk about failure because mm -hmm. lesson number four is pressure is only felt by those that fail. Mm -hmm. It's people, what that really means is that people make excuses for their own weaknesses. We've all got weaknesses. But it's very tiresome for me to hear people say, oh, yeah, I couldn't handle it. Or yep. I'd rather keep my mouth shut. Firstly, I would never tell anyone if that was the case with me because that's something inside me to sort out. And secondly, it's probably lacking appreciation that we've all got an opportunity in life to do something. And it won't always go right. So don't start crying around me. Go out and do something about it. And if you do fail, make it one time you fail and use that as a springboard to succeed. It's about character, isn't it? It's about what's inside you. Do you think we breed character enough into people these days? No, no, we don't. And, and, and sometimes it's frightening. I had this thing with my children about, I love them so much, but... When it comes down to it, are they going to be good enough in this world? Mm. Not, you know, when dad's not there. You know, my kids was, you know, 
Sometimes they were taken to school in limos. They went to private schools. All the things that I hated when I was younger because I had an inferiority complex about people who had things I didn't have. And you think, do you spoil them? And then you realise, maybe not. You see, it, I mean, Eddie's a great example. I can't believe how he's turned out. He's a credit to me and what he does. Yep. And he's got a tremendous work ethic. And he doesn't need to have. You know, he was never going to starve or go without. And yet there's something inside. And that's what everyone's got to find. They've got to find that inner strength that takes them past ordinary people if they want to be special. So what did you do then? Say, if we take Eddie as an example. So as a parent, what did you, like, what were the most important characteristics that you would have demonstrated or nurtured in him that well, gave him I mean, that drive? I think it's just lessons. I mean, everything in our house is competitive. Tremendously competitive, viciously competitive. So even now, I play table tennis with my grandchildren on a Sunday. I don't let them win a point, not a point, not a point. They win a point, they've won a point themselves. Yeah. And, you know, every now and again, oh, Bazza, can't you let us win one? But it's getting closer. The 13-year-old is getting closer. And it's only a matter of time. And I was like that with Eddie. You know, we'd play cricket. I wouldn't hold back. I was quite a quick bowl when I was young. I'd bowl flat out to him, no matter what age he was. You want to be in this game? We'll find out. When I thought he was going a little bit too public school-ish, I took him, I famously took him down to the gym and we had a proper, what was supposed to be a proper three-round fight, a proper fight. And uh, he dropped me twice in the second round. We never had the third <laughs> round. But I left happier than he did, you know, because, because I found out something about my son that I hoped was inside him. He didn't swallow it. Right. He had some character about him. And he took a couple, not many, and he handed it out, you know, and it was nice. He was just disappointed he didn't have a chance to beat me up in one one extra round. <laughs> but no, it it's it's not something you can describe in in a one page or a set of lines. All parents all parents love their children and no children in the world are born bad. It's up to us. And sometimes we let our kids down and sometimes they surprise us with how good they are. And I, I've been very blessed. Number five is you will run a better business and a better life if you think poor. Do you know what? That is probably the greatest line I've ever read and I use it all the time. There are lots of people that achieve short-term success. They get, they get lucky, like it says, better to be born lucky. But they haven't got in them to be sustainable and that's because they don't think poor they think they've cracked it and I I think I might have got a little bit like that in the 80s a little bit where I'd made a load of money and you think I'm untouchable you're never untouchable you're never over the winning line when the fat lady sings that's the time you what the, what the greatest song ever written The Gambler it's time Count. enough for counting when the dealing's done so up to that stage, you think poor, but that has a twofold connection. One, it makes you get value for money, even if you're stinking rich, even if you've got money coming out of your ears. Do you really want to be treated like that person? Or are you going to think poor and say, I want my value? It doesn't make you a nasty person. It just means don't disrespect me. I'm thinking poor. Two, with the clients and the people that you're servicing, if you think poor, you're going to give them value for money because you realise that that customer will keep coming back to you yeah. if you've serviced their needs properly and you haven't taken liberties with them either. Sometimes there are people there that you think, oh. And again, I think this is an attitude that takes some time to evolve. I've no doubt I took people's trousers down in deals over the years. I've no doubt some people took mine down. But when you start thinking poor, it gives you a new balance because you're just, you're running it just on the facts of the situation, aren't you? And what do you do to check yourself when you realise that you're not thinking poor? I have a wife that tells me keep my feet on the ground. Yeah. It's very tempting when you get old, especially men, because men are basically immature far more than women. And, you know, you think, I'm Jack the lad. You wake up in the morning, you're feeling happy, you think, you know what? I am untouchable. The moment you think like that, it's a slippery slide down. 
you've got to keep thinking about the long-term plan. So you put in plans in your head because you ask yourself, what do you want to achieve, don't you? And what you want to achieve is different at different stages in your life. You know, you start off, my, I remember the first thing I want to do, I want to have my own house. You know what I mean? I, we got our own family house. I was 18, our first time we bought a house. You know, it was great. But then I think as a working class bloke, I want to pay my mortgage off. I want to pay my, you know, because then no one can take that away from yeah. me. I'll always have a house over my head. You know, it's a bit of a negative thought as well as a positive yeah, yeah. thought. But then you set different barriers where you want to be. And there's always, people say, what's enough money? How many times people said to you, what's enough money? There is no enough. It's not the whole point. The whole context of money is not about what's enough. You're playing a game. You're playing to win. There's no limit. You don't stop. You don't ever stop. Because once you stop, what else is there to do? So you don't think you've made it? Oh, of course not. I'm on a journey. I'm nowhere near come to the end of it. It's like people say to me, wow, darts. It was a tiny little business. It's now massive. What second biggest rated sport behind soccer on Sky? We haven't started. People with small visions think we've made it. That's because they haven't got the vision. World domination, global domination. By the way, you're never going to hit the target you set. Yeah. But you've got to... You know, you've got to look at that little light coming down the tunnel and convince yourself it's not a train coming towards you, right? But it's a long way away. So you never, ever stop. Because if the day you stop, you're weak. And the day you're weak, you won't be a success. But there's, a, but there's that great quote, I think it was that Joe Louis that said, it's hard to get up and run when you're wearing silk pyjamas by yeah. yourself. Yeah. How, when you look at your your home and it's yeah. and you're surrounded by opulence and wealth and all the trappings of the success that have you, you have enjoyed. Have you seen my place? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You haven't been but, to my tent. Yeah. But how do you keep that that mindset? It's of an attitude. Oh. It's, you see, when Joe Lewis said that, he's coming out of an environment of complete and utter poverty, probably troubled childhood, yeah. uh, dealing with very unsavoury characters, having to earn a living with his fists. And suddenly he gets silk pyjamas. That's a quantum stage of his life that's very difficult to evaluate. My grandfather was an oil tanker driver for 40 years. All he talked about was retiring at 65. And once he got to 65, he sat in his chair and he was dead two years later. It happens to a lot of people. Yep. That's because they set different targets. The answer is to have an open-ended approach to say, I just want to be the best I can be every day of my life, every hour of my life. There isn't a day off. There isn't a time off mentally. You know, I mean, I, I have holidays. I, I, I sit around sometimes. I go fishing a lot, I, but I'm always thinking. And I have some great ideas when I'm thinking, you know. Some, some of them may work, some of them don't work. You mustn't take the easy way out. You mustn't. It's so tempting because, again, it comes back to what is enough. Enough is not a material question. It's a mental question. Enough is when your brain says, I really don't want to get out of this chair anymore. That's, the, that's enough. Yeah. Enough is when you just lose that passion to do what you've loved doing every day of your life. And please God, you can never say for sure, it's a cruel world as we know, that uh, you keep that feeling in your head and it drives you forward every day and that's why it has to be a game because it's too serious to be treated seriously yeah unusual things happen every day of your life mm. how you deal with them makes you unusual everybody in this world has got well not everybody but pretty well everyone's different they've all got a different dna i think the odds of having the same dna are 14 million to one actually exactly the same as the number of Telephone lines there are in this country as well. And actually, exactly the same odds as winning the National Lottery. It's the same as having the same DNA. There you go. Put that in your Christmas cracker. <laughs> so we all deal with things differently and we're all different. And people have different approaches and different ways and different thoughts in their head, different circumstances. Everybody in the world is absolutely better than anybody else at something. The sadness is most of them don't find out what it is because they don't get the opportunity. But nature says that they must be better at something than everyone else because they're different. 
when you get into a situation in in life and you're on some sort of progression, you, you have to make a lot of decisions, and sometimes they'll come at you from really bizarre angles, you know. And you can mix a lot of these rules, by the way, together. I'll, t- I'll tell you a little story. So I'm doing my conquers in 1989. For those of you who don't understand what your conquers is, it's not a good time. I'm losing millions of pounds. I owe the bank millions of pounds. And like a fighter coming out for the later championship rounds, I'm getting close to having enough. I learned more during this period, by the way, than I learned the whole of my life. I never shared that time with anybody, wives, family, anything. It wasn't their job to know. It was my job to fix. And I had an event starting. It was the European Snooker League. I think it was starting in January 89. And Christmas Eve, 1988, I had one last pitch. I needed a sponsor for £300,000. And I didn't have one. And I was losing so much money. This was like, for the first time, I actually thought, I'm a chartered accountant. I can always get a job. So I wasn't going to starve. I wasn't going to be in trouble. But the dreams of what I was thinking of uh, my life was going to be clearly wasn't happening. I got off at Slough Station to see Trust House 40. The managing director there was a guy called Alan Hearn. No relation, but interesting. Same surname. Four o'clock. I got off the train at Slough and it started to snow. It was like a Dickens novel. Walked into it. My heart wasn't in it at all. Got in to see Mr. Hearn. He said, what have you got for me? I said, and I started the sales pitch, which I'm generally quite good at, but this was awful. My heart, it it was, I'd had too much of a battering. I'd lost too many deals. Uh, Finished it in 20 minutes. Quite honestly, I was an embarrassment to be there. Not professional at all. And he looked at me and he said, it's Christmas Eve. It's 4.30 Christmas Eve. I went, I know. He said, you must really need this. And I said, tell the truth. I said, I do. Mm. I really need this. And he said, well, I've got no money. And that was like someone kicked me straight in the lower regions. I thought, well, that's it. I can't do more than I've done. I've given it the best shot. I've had two years of absolutely nightmares. And I've shouldered it on my own. Probably a mistake. So I just thought, well, I'll go out with some class. And I said, well, Mr. Hearn, thank you very much for seeing me. I appreciate it's Christmas Eve. Let me wish you and your family a happy new year. I turned around to walk out the door and he said, but I've got hotel rooms. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, I've got no money. I said, no, I understood that bit. <laughs> he said, but I've got hotel rooms, he said. And at that time, Trust House 40 had Sandy Lane in Barbados, Plaza Athena in Paris, Waldorf in London. They'd Great hotels. He said, I will give you £300,000 of hotel rooms, but no money for this sponsorship. And we shook hands. I left. By the time I got walked back to Slough Station, I'd sold the lot to mates of mine in the travel business at a 40% discount for cash. I got 180 grand. That 180 grand saved my life, saved my business, and saved me, more importantly, show me that you're never completely finished. You know, while you're breathing, there's fighting the old dog. That was a 12th round knockout for me in my world. But it taught me lots of things. It taught me that when you're in situations like that, the situation will define you as a person as well as you will define the situation. And you learn more about yourself in adversity than you'll ever learn in success. And what did you learn about yourself that surprised you? I've got some nuts, mate. I'm unbeatable. I'm totally and completely unequivocally unbeatable. But you didn't know that before, right? No. I didn't know how unbeatable because I had never been beaten that badly. It's like a fighter. Just look at it as a fight. There's plenty of times you go in the ring, you fancy the job. You're unbeatable. Yeah, yeah. It's all in the head. Other times you go in the ring and think, this geezer's too good for me. You've lost before you start. Yeah. It's in the head. But over a period of time, you learn a little bit more about yourself because you have more experience in different circumstances. Then you find out what you really are. I found out I'm unbeatable. I can't be beat. This is impossible. You condemn me. 
You can damage me. You're never, ever going to beat me. I'm too happy to, I'm too happy not to exist. <laughs> Go on, tell us what well, that means. Well, that actually takes us nicely onto on. rule number seven, doesn't it? Life ends in tears. Yeah. So sums smile it well, for just the rest sums of it all life. up. You know, my father never taught me anything because he was, you know, he wasn't a, an active father. Yeah. But what he did say was, don't waste a minute, son. Yeah. Don't waste a minute. But everyone knows it, this. Everyone knows this already, but we all walk around obsessed with the tiny little things that get us down or frustrate us or missing a bus. Or, you've managed yeah. to get rid of those things. Like, how have you done that? Well, like, again, I think you just compartmentalise compartmentalize your brain into such, what's important? What is important in your life? You know, you could make a list, couldn't you? Most important in your life, family, without a doubt. That's, don't want to plug my book, but bi business a close second is what it says on the back yeah. page. And that's exactly what it is. Everyone knows. But when it comes to Sunday lunch around my house, you talk dinner, my wife will pick up your plate and give it to the dog. <laughs> End of story. No one disagrees. The woman's in control. You know, she's in charge. She's the matriarch of the family. And that's how it should be. Well, good, I've, I've been used to that succession of time. When my grandfather retired at 65, I remember him saying about a month before he retired to my grandmother, Gladys, I don't know what we're going to do when we retire. Because my pension is only going to be three or four quid a month or week or whatever. How are we going to survive? She said, well, we've always got our savings, Will. And he looked at her. I'll never forget his face. Savings? What are you talking about, savings? She said, well, I've always put a few pound away. Have you? He had no idea. Been married 45 years. He had no idea. He said, how much have we got? She said, a little over 6,000 pound. He nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> Six. Thousand pound. I mean, that, that was enough to buy a little bungalow, by the way, when yeah, he retired yeah. in Shubri Ness and some change. But it was like he had mm. absolutely zero idea. So, you know, just go through your life. I mean, it's terribly easy to say. And look, people are out there suffering. We're in a recession. There's going to, the gap between the haves and the have nots is widening every day. We've got to do something. We've got to do a lot about it because this country is unique and without getting too deep, we don't look unique enough for me. But somehow or the other, you've got to try and push that to one side because we're, we're going through the motions of waiting to die. So deal with it. And you do know, I think life begins with smiles and ends with tears, doesn't it? Mm. But... That's, that's what's going to be. That's one thing you can't change. So there's no point. In, when you can't affect anything, don't give it a moment's thought because that moment is a wasted thought. And you could be thinking about something else. And as you get older, you're now 74. Mm. Are you more aware of your mortality? Do yeah. You, oh, do you all sort the of time. fear the end or not? I spend most of my time planning how I can get around inheritance tax. I hate it. <laughs> You know, 40% of government. That's Jesus a very practical Christ. way of looking at it. 40% you've already paid tax on, by the way. I know, I know. Don't tell me, don't tell me. It's absolutely disgraceful. But then I start thinking about there's other things we can do. I think there's three stages. Actually, it's five stages in life, but really three for most people. Number one is the selfish stage when you're fighting to get out of wherever you are, fighting to achieve you. Whatever you're doing, you can be a rich kid. You're still going to be selfish. You don't, just Poor doesn't change anything mm. it's an attitude perhaps you're not a nicest husband perhaps you're not the nicest father you're so determined to succeed you've got to run over people to get there yep. there'll be casualties then you get to a certain stage where you think I'm getting there inside you start to relax your metabolism slows down a little bit you now I used to have a terrible temper when I was younger I, that, that's gone it's gone I smile at everyone now why did that go Oh, 73. <laughs> no, there are times, but no. But what I'm saying is that's the selfish. So the next one is that when you can be a decent father, decent husband and a better person and you're into the, the swing of business and life and you're mature a little bit and then you, you become a little bit nicer. The third stage is where you say, well, that's all taken care of now. So I can look at my community or where I come from and perhaps do a little bit of good to that. It does go to number four. We can say I can look at my country and say, how can I do well for the country? And number five is how can I do well for the world? But unless you're 
Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, very rarely do we get to number five. I don't suppose I'll have a dramatic effect on the world, but I can have an effect on where I came from and the community I work in. And that is actually another target as for later in life. Because the great thing about making money and being successful is the race is over when you've done that. There isn't a chapter on what to do with it. So you might as well do some good with it. See, that reminds us, a few of our previous guests that we've interviewed, Barry, have spoken about a book called The Second Mountain mm. by an American writer called David Brooks that says that the first mountain of your life is your stages one and two. Yeah. The second mountain is stage three when you start yeah, thinking yeah. about legacy and yeah, wider yeah. impact. So how, how do you intend to make a difference to a wider community? Well, I've... I've it's not something I publicise, number one, because I always hate people, you know. Sure. Charity, charity. Giving yeah. charity publicly is not really charity. So we, st we started the Matram Family Foundation. Okay. And we support various, mainly children's hospices. All that. Wherever I have a place of business. So I'm in Bristol where World Snook is based. I have a children's hospice there. Sheffield, which is very important to me. I have a hospice there. A couple in London. Right. One in Stoke, funnily enough, because Stoke's where a lot of darts players come from. Okay. And a particular scheme on for the kids in Dagenham where I was born. So, and that's a beginning. There's not, we haven't finished at all. But as I say, the game, the business game is over. What do you want to do? Well, you know, it's, if you could get to a stage in your life where you sit there and probably I've got less expectations than a lot of other people. I can't think of anything I need. I need to get up in the morning. I need to watch some competitive sport where I see people really achieving their dreams and entertaining me by their excellence. But for me personally, I can't think, just give me another day, is all I think. Give me another day. And while you're doing that, you know, you've been quite smart. You've had a few results. God's been kind to you. There's a surplus there that will be used. And actually, it's quite rewarding, but it's not something, again, I don't think I've ever talked about this before. It's not something I really want to share, to be honest with you, because I don't like the downside of that. Which is what? Well, thousands of letters. I mean, soon as, right. you know, thousands. I pick what I want to do, and I try and do it well. And I want, to make, I want that to be a family legacy, because we've been fortunate. And, you know, somehow or another, God knows how, I've been successful. So it's good. But, but that race is over. And when the race is over, you don't need anything else. Let's talk about one of the reasons why the race has been successful, even though you mm. say God knows how. You've given us your life lessons in this mm. interview. And number eight on your life lessons is nothing will change by sitting on the sofa. Well, it's a little bit like the work ethic one, really. but. Sitting on the sofa comes in different stages. You can start off by being lazy. What worries me today, especially amongst some of the youngsters that I see, is that there's not enough get up and go. And a lot of that is society's problem. It's not the, the kids weren't born like that. You know, maybe they didn't get enough parental guidance, maybe. Maybe they didn't get enough activities at school, maybe. Maybe they got in with the wrong crowd who'd failed earlier. I don't know. But for whatever reason is we need to get people motivated to do something. Mm. If the facilities don't exist, I'm a big believer in government spending on sport, which I don't think is anywhere near enough. I think we should be spending the same amount of money on sport as we send on defence. There's a percentage of gross national product that we allocate to overseas good causes, and yet we've got 30% of children undernourished in this country. All these things I can't live with. I don't, I don't see the, the rationale to it. But when you look at kids, it's depressing sometimes. And it may be not their fault, but it's very easy to get in that rut. Gang culture, you know, peer pressure against kids. We talk about carrying knives and things like that. You know, hardly ever did I see a knife growing up. You know, I see a lot of people who were tough guys. A lot of people could fight, but they weren't. 
you know, there wasn't the drugs and all that sort of stuff as much as there is today. And this is an issue that's got to be dealt with because these kids got, if you take away someone's dream, you know, I had a dream, you had a dream. We all had dreams when we were growing up. Sometimes you wanted to be, you know, when I was seven, I wanted to be heavyweight champion of the world so bad. I used to listen to Rocky Marciano fights on my transistor radio, and you know, four o'clock in the morning underneath the bedclothes. So my mum and dad didn't hear. I remember the first fight it was Rocky Marciano and Archie Moore. Oh yeah, and I remember the first Ali fight I ever listened to was Ali against Archie Moore. Archie Moore, yeah, you know, falling four, but yeah. unbelievable. So we had a dream, and what worries me about today's society is not enough kids have a dream, and it's our job to give them that dream somehow or the other. If you were given thirty seconds or a minute in front of a bunch of young people, what done, do you say to drive that message home I, to them? I've done lots of things with young people. I used to do some lot of stuff in the East End London with the police on kids who are on second or third chances. And I used to ask some questions and it used to horrify me. You know, first question was always, hands up, how many of you get out of bed before midday on Saturday? Six out of 20. How many of you have got a part-time job, a proper job, not running bits of paper around for bouncers to sell drugs to people? Proper job, part-time or full-time? Six out of 20. And the worst, how many of you do active sport? Six out of 20. It's a bad percentage. And when we were growing up, everybody tried to do anything. You know, one of the things, you know, I always think about darts is, you know, not everyone can be a professional footballer. But kids can take a dartboard in their bedroom and smash the granny out of the treble 20 and come out and play on a developmental tour and win a few bob and be a hero in their community because they're not professional footballers. They're blokes that might earn 20 grand a year are suddenly earning 200 grand a year, but they look like the bloke around the corner. So that accessibility is why boxing has always been so special because you can come out of nothing and just on your own efforts, mm. you can become something. My job was because I wasn't good enough. I mean, I would have liked to have been them. Looking back, I'm glad I weren't because my job goes on forever yeah. until the good Lord takes me. But, you know, that extra ability to go that extra mile is what we've got to put in the kids today. And it comes down, like everything, to money. You know, we spend so many billion a year on defence to safeguard this country, which I accept. But we're safeguarding the character of the country and sport builds that character of that country. So my mindset says spend the same on both. It's not about inviting test match players or... Europe or, or footballers to Downing Street for a photo opportunity with the then incumbent Prime Minister. I wouldn't go until you start doing something for grassroots that gets on my wavelengths where every kid's got a chance, not just private school kids. This, the diversity is what I'm looking for. Equal opportunity, barriers to entry to be removed. Everything should be based on ability because life is a meritocracy. End of speech. <laughs> Number nine on your mm. list for life is avoid being a secret. If you're good, admit it. If you're great, shout it from the rooftops. But this, do you know what? When I wrote that, I didn't realise how smart that was. When you look at sport today, so much of it is becoming, it's more important to be famous than be good. That's a bit of a generalisation. But if you're not famous, you're never going to maximise your commercial earnings. So many great sportsmen have gone under the radar. Mm. I mean, I was thinking, take Errol Graham, Bomber yeah. Graham, one Bomber of the Graham, greatest yeah. middleweights of all time. He wasn't particularly famous. He didn't have a style that was particularly attractive commercially and no one wanted to fight him because he was so good. So, yep. He never made any money. Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn, I believe Errol Graham would have boxed their ears off. Yeah, yeah. But Definitely. he never got the chance. So it's about opportunity. It's about taking your chance at the right time. It's, it's so important in today's world to be known, you know. Uh, it's funny that a huge social media following, you know, look at the YouTube boxers. I mean, good luck to them. Listen, good luck to everybody that makes a living. It's a tough old world. But don't tell me they're any good because they're not. But they're very famous and they make millions and millions of pounds more 
than a kid who's come up the hard way and paid it. You know, doesn't seem fair. When I was a chartered accountant, I was from a different area. In those days, I was very lucky to become a chartered, to get in in the first place from where I came from was, was unusual. On occasions, not every day, I qualified very young. I was probably one of, if not the youngest fellow of the Institute, or one of the fellows of all time. I was, I mean, I'm super smart. Now, don't tell lies. Tell the truth. <laughs> I used to wear a white suit to, sh to work every now and again. Did you? Yeah. And people used to go potty, but everyone knew who I was. When it come up for thinking about jobs or promotions, they knew me. They wouldn't have known me otherwise. I'd have just been another faceless individual. But I turned up looking like John Travolta every now and again. And people would take the mick. I remember getting into a lift with a senior partner of my firm, one of the biggest firms in the world. And he looked down his glasses, and I'm in this white suit, and he said, do you work here? <laughs> I went, yes, sir. I'm, I'm Hearn from such and such. Good Lord. He remembered me the rest of his career. And there's hundreds and hundreds of people in that office. So when you talk about boxers, we talk about personality as opposed to ability. Great if you've got both, but that's quite rare. But then you go, look, at isn't that not the case in all sports? You know, is, uh, I don't know, is a cricketer better now than he was 20 years ago? So who knows? Is a boxer better? Who knows? Is a snooker player? How many people know Ronnie O'Sullivan in comparison? I mean, difficult to say that because Ronnie's been around for years and years and years. But the personality and what they say, the media work they do, how much they put themselves out, is what I say to people. Now, if you look back on the snooker era, I got eight snooker players in a room and said, right, we're, we're in a soap opera here, boys. We all need a role. So I'm not going to change anybody, but I'm going to accelerate, accentuate your personality. So Dennis Taylor, you're the little lovable fat Irishman that tells jokes. Tell jokes all the time, Dennis. Griffiths, you're Welsh, so you think you can sing. So when you're playing snooker, have a little sing-song every now and again and comb your hair all the time. Davis, you're the boring one. You wear a white shirt, black tie, you only drink water and you don't talk. Jimmy, you're the artful dodger. You can't read or write, but you can work a six-horse accumulator out faster than any man I've ever known. <laughs> and we went through all of this. And then you just pick the same thing up in darts. Everyone gets a nickname. Everyone gets entry music. And they go out and live it. Tell the crowd you're happy to be there. Show them by your face you appreciate their support. Like, don't have a barrier. Embrace. How do we move that into the real world, if you like, like into people's everyday lives who are listening to this? But what do they do? And how can they be better? That's how you start off. Yeah. And it's not just being better at what they do, it's being better known for what they do. So you're doing a podcast. There's a couple of people listen to this podcast. The better you market your podcast, which is marketing you, the more successful you'll be. So don't be a secret. By the way, if you're shit, be a secret. <laughs> Final lesson is number 10. When you need a hand, you're more likely to get a kick in the nuts. When you need no help, there'll be a queue of people waiting to give you things, which is one of life's great mysteries. And it's more a mystery than a lesson, really, because it's what exists. When you need a helping hand, you find out who your friends are and you're surprised how few there are. That's life. Mm. You're much more likely to get a kick in the nuts. People around you really want to see you fail most yeah. of the time. I love the phrase, keep an eye on who doesn't clap when you win. Yeah. And you see yeah. there's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. But also you'd be surprised how people close to you really want you not to be successful. Yeah. Because your success reminds them of their failure. So tell us more about where, that, where you've observed that in your life. I think any successful sportsman is... You know, we've, we have a habit in this country of building people up and then knocking them down. We've done it regularly over the years through the media mainly. But that's just part and parcel of our, we look on our own shortcomings and criticise those that don't have those shortcomings 
because we really want them to be more like the failure that we are in in a bigger picture. Yeah. yeah. So what you would find is on the way up, no one's going to give you nothing. In a way, that differentiates between success and failure. It's a greasy pole. Some people get up a greasy pole over and over and over again. You know, other people will slide down and say, I can't do it. When you get success, that's the scary bit. You don't pay for anything. I remember going out with Steve Davis years ago when snooker was massive in the 80s. And we were mates. I mean, one of the nicest things, he's still my best mate now, although we're so different people, you wouldn't think we could ever survive with each other. But we actually, in a way, bizarre way, feed off each other. I mean, Steve Davis has done five Glastonbury's now. <laughs> Most people don't even know he's a snooker player. They think he's DJ Thundermuscle. But he's got a great band, so he tells me. I've listened to it. It's not my style. But we'll give him a plug anyway. Utopia Strong. Well, it's a it's a mushroom from Holland. Anyway, neither of them. All of a sudden, people just give you things. So why are they giving rich people things for free? It's, it's bizarre. What's, what, what does that do? And of course, we we're gonna we're gonna take it. Do you? Yeah. Well, no, they want the reflected resist, glory, mate. don't Listen, they? That's why I they still do it. take I still take my hair shampoo out of the hotel when I go when I leave. Don't you? And if, I, and if I put three in my bag and there's three more, I'll take them as well. Why? I mean, just what you do. I mean, Eddie goes out and, I mean, he gets dressed by people. I'm not going to give them a plug because they're not dressing me, so they don't <laughs> deserve that. But, you know, I'm like, I know how much these clothes are and you think, Jesus Christ, you wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, it's a fortune. It's just, it's just this bizarre <laughs> trait of human nature. To be kinder to people that don't you don't need to be kind of and forgetting the people that you should be being kind to. And that goes right through society. See, but I'm surprised that, that like, that's why I'm asking you about, do you take it? Because I won't tell you the name of the person that told me this, but there's a, there's a famous football manager that told me the story how he, when he first got famous, mm. he had that experience of people giving him stuff, free meals, mm. things like that. And it was one of his colleagues that said, there's no such thing as a free meal. There's no such thing as a free well, suit. They'll, well, they'll come, there's they'll a come price to, that they'll yeah, come yeah, back then, and demand. Again, there's two things to do. If, firstly, if I go back to when Steve Davis was massive, we used to go out to restaurants all the time. And we used to toss a coin because we're mates. Who's going to pay? Right. It's tails. When he... Had to pay. He would ask for the bill. Invariably, they would say, Mr. Davis, it's a pleasure to have you here. When I lost, I used to pass it, give me the bill. After a few times, I said to him, Look, let's not toss a coin. You ask for the bill all the time, which we did, and we never paid. It was bizarre. The, what your friend is talking about, he's quite right, is it's levels of favours, really, you know. You never do a favour. Favours have to be repaid. Having a gratis T-shirt or whatever is not a favour. Favour is usually cash or services beyond that. Right. And then that's when you're in trouble. So you don't do favours because favours have to be repaid. And that can be very bad for you. Right. I like that distinction. Yeah, it's a big distinction. Big distinction. I mean, someone gives you a Ferrari, that's not... That's not giving you a gift. What I'm saying is just the general walks of life is, you know, you get in a taxi and the taxi driver goes, Bow, I love the darts, mate. I don't, I'm not taking money off you. That would be an insult to take money off him now, off to give him money. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's, it's levels, but, right. but you're right. You mustn't do favours. I've never known. There's no such thing as a free. When you say there's no such thing as a free lunch, there is, but there's no such thing as a free Ferrari or a free hundred grand or whatever. You yeah, know? yeah. Final question for the people that have listened to this conversation, and it's been absolutely full of amazing gems and life lessons and wisdom. What would you want to leave people with? People from all walks of life and all ages and all backgrounds and all levels of success listen to this podcast. And it isn't a podcast mm, about oh. success. It's a podcast about happiness uh, and self-worth. I think you do have a different attitude and I'm sure young people won't relate to some of the things I say as much as 
the elder people, because what I'm talking about is what your granddad might tell you or your great aunt, uncle, or, or your dad told you when you was younger. Um, the biggest lesson of all is just comes back to be the best you can be. That's all you can do. You can't do anything else. So there's no pressure because you can't be better than you can be. And try and do it with a smile on your face. And don't take yourself too seriously because I'm not. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Brilliant. Barry. Amazing. Thank you, Barry. Pleasure, pleasure. Just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast make a real difference to the world. See you soon.